they always just drag you in. Okay, but anyway, I'm griping on tape now, so sorry about that. Okay, any questions on anything we've done so far? No, sir. All right. What's that? I was saying that the topic was chapter one. Yeah, we're in chapter one, which is system of linear equations, 1.1, which is introduction to system of linear equations, and we're at, on page nine, example nine, top of the page. Okay. Um, here is this system of equations. All right. X2 minus X3 is equal to zero. X1 minus X3 minus 3X3 is equal to minus 1. And negative X1 plus 3X2 is equal to 1. All right. Now, this one has enough gaps and spaces in it. It almost looks like this might be fairly easy to solve some other method. And it would be. For instance, if I were doing this, I would say x2 equal x3, you know, by adding x3 to both sides there, and then plug that in here, and that gives me an x1 and an x3 here, then take those two and solve those. But let's do it the way we were talking about by row reduction, uh, uh, getting it into row echelon form and that type of thing. Now remember what the goal is there. The first thing we want is to have a 1 as the coefficient of the first variable in the first equation. But the first variable isn't in the first equation, okay? So we don't have that. But what we can do is flip the two. Remember, we can always exchange two equations. It doesn't change the answer at all. It's an equivalent form. So what we'll do first is just flip those two. That would be x1 minus 3x3 is equal to minus 1. x2 minus x3 is equal to 0. Now, time out just a moment before I get any further. Remember I said, and I copied it out of the book, and they had it, and that's why I didn't don't want me to say it. Remember when you're doing these, always line up the variables with the appropriate variable. The equal signs, line those up as well, and then line up the constants at the end as well. And here's Keystone. All right, we just got started on... Example 9, I was stuck in a vortex of emails down in my office and lost track of time. Uh, and so we're late getting started. Okay. And the last equation, of course, is minus x1 plus 3x2 is equal to 1. Now what we had, this was the system we had, and as I said... It would be easy to solve by substitution in another way, but let's go on and do it this way, the way they suggested. And what the suggestion was, always have the first variable have a coefficient of 1. Well, this one doesn't even have a first variable. So how you accommodate that, remember the three rules you can do. Exchange two equations, multiply by a non-zero number, or add a multiple of one equation to another. Well, let's just flip these two, and that's what we did here. So now we have a 1 for a coefficient here. So we've already eliminated this one. It's not there. So let's eliminate that one. How do we eliminate the x, the minus x1 in the third equation? Equation 1 plus equation 3 becomes the new equation 3. Okay? So we do that. We don't need to do anything to 2. So we leave 1 alone, x1 minus 3x3 is equal to minus 1. We leave number 2 alone. x2 minus x3 is equal to 0. And then the new equation, when you add 1 and 3 together, what do you get is your first term? 0, okay? When you add 1 and 3 for the second variable, what do you get? 
3x2. And when you add 1 and 3 for the third variable, what do you get? Minus 3x3. Okay, and that's equal to minus, no, that's equal to 0, right, when you add the, the, the last two. Got it? All right. <clears throat> now, before you do or go anywhere else, what do you notice about those last two equations? Yeah, they're just a multiple of each other. Okay? The third equation is the multiple of the second. It's just three times the second. So guess what those are going to be? Identical lines. They're identical. One's just three times the other. They'll be identical lines. So guess what? Infinite number of solutions. If you were to, if you were to take it one more step and multiply the, uh, this, this equation by minus 3 and add it to this one, what would you get? Minus 3x2 plus 3x2 would be 0. Positive 3x3 minus 3x2 would be 0. And 0 plus 0 is equal to 0. Yeah, 0 equals 0, that's always true. Infinite number of solutions. Anytime you wind up with a case that is always true, infinite number of solutions. You wind up with a case that's never true, no solution. Inconsistent system. You wind up with a case with one and only one solution, that's when you have this. Now these are planes, not lines, but these two happen to be lines in the plane. There's no x1 variance here, so you're in the uh, x2, x3 plane. And these are just lines in that plane. And they're the same line. So <coughs> that's the case of infinitely many solutions which was the title of example six, okay? Uh, so I'll go on and do what I said before. Minus three row two plus row three yields a new row three. And that would give you a zero plus zero equals zero. Always true. All right. There is another, oh, oh. Let's go on and take it that last step. They're doing one more thing to this that I wasn't aware they were doing yet. So let's do it. Let's do what we just said. Leave equation 1 alone. x1 minus 3x3 is equal to minus 1. x2 minus x3 is equal to 0. And when you multiply the second equation by 3. Uh, okay, sorry about that. I'm sli slipping into a new module here. Uh, what we're going to be doing later, we're going to refer to them as rows. Right now we're referring to them as equations. So sorry about that. I put rows there. That's what I'm used to doing. So that's minus 3 times row. <laughs> I did it again. Equation to, yeah, my eraser's not working. Okay. Minus 3 times equation 2, let me make sure I write an E this time, plus equation 3 becomes the new equation 3. Okay. So let's do that. For equation 3, negative 3 times x2 would be negative 3x2 plus 3x2 would be 0, okay? Negative 3 times negative 1 would be positive 3x3 minus 3x3. That would be 0. And then 0 or minus 3 times 0 is 0 plus 0 is 0. All right. Now, this row gives you nothing, <laughs> literally, 0, nothing. doesn't give you any help at all. So what we would do now to say what's the solution for this system of equation? There's an infinite number of solutions, so how do we express those? Well, the variables that have your leading ones, remember those are our important things, this one and that one, leave alone for right now. The one without the leaving one, 
and it doesn't matter where you do it, but you let that be some parameter. Their favorite one is T, and I think that's what they use in the book. So let's let uh, X3 equal some parameter T, okay? Then we use that to back substitute, so to speak. So the second equation becomes x2 minus t is equal to 0. So guess what x2 is? Add t to both sides, and you get x2 is also equal to t. And we saw that earlier. That first equation up there, I said you could have solved this with, say, x2 equals x3. So since you know x3 is t, x2 also is t. Okay, now we go to the top equation. Okay, and we plug in what we know there. X1 minus 3, but X3 is equal to T, so that's minus 3T is equal to minus 1. So that means that X1 is equal to 3T minus 1. Okay, so if you wanted to write an ordered triplet here, your x1 is 3t minus 1, your x2 is t, and your x3 is t. Okay? Now, give me a t. Any t in the world. Make up a t. A number. Four. Okay? So this will be 12 minus 1 is 11, 4, 4. Let's see if that works. Uh, 4 minus 4 is 0. Yes, that works. 11 minus 12 is minus 1. That works. And minus 11 plus 12 is positive 1. Yeah, that works. Okay? Any T you want to plug in there, it'll make this work. Infinite number of solutions, you choose a T. Any real number t in the world, plug it in, you've got a solution. So that's what we mean by infinite number of solutions. So you write that in what we call parameter form. Pick a parameter. Usually let the parameter be the, the variable without a leading one. Okay? In this case, it was our x3. Okay? That's what you let be your variable. There may be uh, your parameter. There may be some equations you run into that you need two, three, or four parameters. We'll see never one with four, but we'll see some with two later. Okay. Now, there is a discovery at the bottom of page nine. Um, Do you want to do that one or not? There's nothing real special about it that I can see, but it might give you some insight somewhere. Uh, you want to do it or not? What you think? Huh? Uh, we'll take your recommendation. Say again? We'll take your uh, it doesn't matter to me. Uh, it's whether you think you'll, it'll be instructive to you. Huh? We can keep moving forward. Keep moving forward. Is that okay? Okay. All right, then homework exercises will be any of the odds, one through five. By the way, they're all at Calc Chat. If you look at the top margin of your text, those who have a text, it says see calcchat.com for worked out solutions to the odd number exercises. So what I would do, I wouldn't go straight there. I would work it myself, okay? And then look in the back of the book because the odd number have the answers in the back of the book. If you got the right answer, move on. If you don't get the right answer, see if you can figure out how to get the right answer. Okay, if you can't figure it out, then go to calcchat.com and they have worked out solutions. Now, if that doesn't make any sense to you, bring it to class the next time. And when I ask, are there any questions, hit me with those questions. Don't hit me too hard, but hit me with the questions. Okay. All right, then do any of either seven or nine. They're both at calcchat. Do any of the odds 11 through 23, they're all at count chat. Now that 19 and 21 look, and even 23 look fairly interesting. Uh, if you feel like 
any you want to see any of those done, I'll be glad to do those. Uh, then do any of the odds 25 to 29, they're all at Calc Chat. Then do any of the odds 31 to 35, they're all at Calc Chat. Uh, do any of the odds, a whole bunch of these, 37 to 55, they should all be at Calc Chat. And you'll notice there, 55 gets up to four equations with four unknowns, so a bit more. 45 has decimals in it, so a variety of things there. Then do either 57 or 59, they're both at Calc Chat. 59 has a bunch of fractions, 57 decimals. Okay, then do either 61 or 63, they both should be at Calc Chat. 65 should be at Calc Chat. 67 is a true false. Don't expect to see many of those on a test, but that may be instructive as far as uh, uh, understanding the concepts here. And then 69 should be at Calc Chat. Oh, there's more. 71 or 73 should be at Calc Chat. 75 is at Calc Chat. Any of the odds, 77 to 81 should be at Calc Chat. 83 should be at Calc Chat. 85 is a writing exercise. If you want to look at that, you certainly can. 87 is sort of an abstract exercise. You can do that if you'd like. Uh, 89 is a discovery type thing. You can certainly look at that. And 91, you can look at that. Any questions? All right, let's move on to 1.2. Okay. Uh, 1.2 is heading into where we already started Gaussian elimination, but then we're going to also add another name to it, Gauss-Jordan elimination. <clears throat> so, here we're going to introduce the concept of Gaussian elimination as a procedure. Okay, I'm no, sorry. Let me back up. Section 1.1 introduced Gaussian elimination as a procedure for solving a system of linear equations. In this section, we'll study a procedure more thoroughly, beginning with some definitions, and the first is the definition of a matrix. Okay? Now, matrices can be used for lots of things. They don't have to stand for equations, but we're going to let them do that. Okay, and this, uh, but before we do that, let's just define what a matrix is. If M and N are both positive, plus with the IV is positive, integers. Now, of course, what are integers? What are positive integers specifically? Counting numbers. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Why didn't they say counting numbers? That would have been a lot easier. But positive integers are your counting numbers. Then, if those are both positive integers, M and N are positive integers, then you can talk about an M by N, okay, matrix. Okay? And what that is, is a rectangular array of numbers. Okay? Now, what kind of numbers are we talking about? Well, they don't even have to be numbers. They just say a rectangular array. So here's what we do. And here's how we label them. So get used to this notation. A11... A12, A13, dot, 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 up to A1N. Okay? That's the first row. So this is called a row. Okay? Then you have A21, A22, A23, dot, 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 up to A2N. Then you have A31. A32, A33, dot, 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 up to A3N. Then you can dot, dot, dot this down until you get A sub M1, 
dot 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 down to a sub m two <coughs> dot 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 down to <coughs> sorry losing my voice down to a sub m three and then we dot 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 and dot 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 and everywhere dot dot until we get down to a sub m n <coughs> <coughs> This is row 1, this is row 2, this is row 3, this is row M, dot, 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 right? This is column 1, this is column 2, this is column 3, and dot, 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 until you get to column N, okay? Now, if you haven't noticed yet, what are these subscripts here? You can think of them as identifiers or addresses okay the first one tells you what row you're in row three all the first uh, subscripts are threes and the second tells you which column you're in here all the second subscripts in this column are twos so this is a rectangular matrix of numbers with m rows the m always refers to rows first the second number always refers to your column. So it's a rectangular array of anything. We're mostly going to use numbers uh, such that you have M rows and N columns. Okay? Now the M and N certainly have to be positive no integers. You can't have three and a half columns. No, you don't have a half a column. They're all positive integers. Okay? So that's what in the a matrix is an M by N uh, matrix is an array of numbers in M rows and columns. Okay, so these subscripts here are the addresses telling you where in that array you're located. Okay, now we often call those addresses A sub I J, where I is the row number and J is the column number. Okay, uh, you're in the ith row, the jth column. Okay, you call the i the row subscript because it's written at a lower thing, and the j is called the column subscript. Okay, they're both integers, so positive integers, they'll just identify which row and column you're with. Okay? Now, when you're talking about an M by N matrix, they call that the size of the matrix. A 2 by 3, a 3 by 2, 7 by 12. You know, that's the size of the matrix. M rows, N columns. Okay? Now, when M is equal to N, that makes it a square matrix because you have M rows and N columns, but they're the same. A 4 by 4, a 3 by 3, whatever. Okay? Uh, and when you have a square matrix, when this uh, M is equal to N, then these diagonal elements are called uh, the one going from upper left to lower right is called your main diagonal. We'll talk about some special features of that later. But that's your main diagonal. Uh, you only refer to those in square matrices. You don't really have a diagonal if it's rectangular and not square. Okay? So only for square matrices. All right. With that in mind, this is pretty easy stuff so far, right? Good. Okay. Um, believe it or not, and by the way, we identify a matrix by square brackets on either side. What's the size of that matrix? One. By? One. Yes, one by one. Always the size is... Something by something. That's a one by one. Technically, it's a square matrix, but it's not much of a matrix, okay? 
So that's a one by one. How about this one? Zero, 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 zero. That's a two by two matrix. Now that has another special name. That's also called the zero two by two matrix because every element in there is zero. Again, not a very interesting matrix, but it is a square matrix, two by two. What would this one be called? E to negative seven pi root two four. That's a two by three matrix. It doesn't matter what numbers are in there. Uh, the entries in a matrix so far, we're allowing to only be real numbers. So it can be positive or negative, fractions or decimals, rational or irrational, zero, that's fine too. Uh, three of those are irrational numbers. E, pi, and root two are all irrational numbers. One's a negative number, that's the minus seven. The two and four are positive numbers. Doesn't matter. You could have had a fraction in there, 0. 0.7, you know, anything. Uh, any real number can be an element of a matrix. Okay? But its size is 2 by 3. Now, moving along. Let's get back to what we were doing before <clears throat> when we had a system of equations. X minus 4y plus 3z is equal to 5 minus x plus 3y minus z is equal to negative 3. 2x minus 4z is equal to 6. There's a system of equations. Now remember when we were solving these, I don't know if you noticed, but it was a pain in the neck hauling around all those variables and stuff like that and keeping up with it. So you can make your load a little lighter if you just represent that system of equation as a matrix. Leave out the letters. But again, it's very important that you have them in the right order. X is over X's, Y's over Y's, Z's over Z's, equal signs over equal signs, and constants over constants. Okay? Now what we do when we do this, when we translate this and make it into what we call an augmented matrix. Here's what the augmented matrix would be, just the number part. So what would be the first entry? One, negative four, three, five, negative one, three, no, that's a Z. Okay. Making fun of my writing, I can tell. It doesn't hurt too bad, okay. Okay. Negative one and negative three. Okay, next. Two. Zero, excellent. Negative four. Six. We call that the augmented matrix. Now, this book approaches this a little backwards in my mind. In my mind, I would have first said, let's just take the variables, the things on the left side, and make that into what we call a coefficient matrix. And then we'll take this column of numbers here and call that a uh, a constant vector or a constant matrix. It's a three by one matrix. It's also an array of numbers. And when you put those together, that's when you augment them. 
So, but they start off with the augmented part and then back off and talk just about the coefficient matrix. The coefficient matrix would just be the, in this case, the square matrix here, 1, minus 4, 3, negative 1, 3, negative 1, 2, 0, negative 4. That would be your coefficient matrix, and what you do is augment that with your constant matrix, uh, vector, or column of numbers, and that gives you your augmented matrix. Okay. Now, this is will explain why I was botching it up before. Uh, okay. So before we talked about operations you can do on equations, right? We call the elementary equation operations. We didn't focus on it, but that's what they were called. You can exchange any two rows. You can multiply any row by, I mean, any equation. Let me get the end of the row. Any equation by a constant number, non zero number. Don't ever go around and multiply by zero. Uh, or you can add a multiple of one equation to another equation, and that's uh, elimination by addition type of stuff. Okay? Well, guess what? The same three equation operations you can do to a matrix. And those are called your elementary row operations. Because what was your equation is now a row. This equation becomes that row. This equation becomes that row. So now they're called elementary row operations. What are they? Exchange any two rows. Multiply any row by a non-zero number. For instance, this right here. Look at here. Let's multiply this row by one half. You get a one, zero, negative two, three. Or you can divide by a non-zero number. Two. That'd be one, zero, negative two, three. Okay, multiply or divide by a non-zero number. Or you can add a multiple of one row to another row, and uh, that's the third elementary operation. Like adding these two rows together. That give you a zero, negative one. Two, okay. So those are all legitimate elementary row operations. They're given the top of page 14. You need to see them. Want me to write them down so you'll remember those, or you got them down pat? Okay. You got your books there at the top of page 14. Okay. And then after they do that, they give them again. Okay. They really like those, don't they? Oh, I'm sorry, sorry, sorry. The top of page 14 are your elementary uh, uh, equation operations, and then they repeated them as elementary row operations. Now, what we then call, when we operate with those, what we called before was equivalent equations, right? Now we get row equivalent matrices. So what we were calling equivalent equations we now are going to call a row equivalent matrices. When you do any of those three operations, changing two rows, multiplying or dividing a row by a non-zero number, and uh, adding a multiple of one row to another row, you get what we call L, uh, row equivalent expressions. So, let's do example two. Okay, let's erase what I've got here. Okay. Now, here's a matrix. Zero, one, three, four. Oh, and by the way, let me, uh, before you came in, uh, uh, Keith, Keith and, uh, I was telling Charles I was caught in a email vortex type thing. Part of the reason, one of those phone calls, well, an email I had to send, and I followed it up with a phone call, and things just got worse from there. But anyway, it was necessary to do. One of those was to get the codes for the text. Do y'all need those yet? He said he thought he could get them to me fairly quickly. Uh, but do y'all have any need for that yet? Say again? Well, yeah, for WebAssign. I'm not ever going to make an assignment on WebAssign, 
but this gives you access to all the tutoring and practice problems, anything you need on website, you can use on your own. But what I was led to believe in my last class was that a student said she could not access her ebook until she got the code. Have y'all had any trouble accessing? Actually, I tried it because I, I knew it wasn't a requirement, but I wanted to, you know, fumble around with it. You know, right. Outside of class. But if you can, if you got the time to put it out there, you know, I can follow up. Well, that's what I'm saying. I called, I emailed the guy this morning, and then followed up with a phone call because last time I talked with him was last spring, and I thought. He may not even work there anymore, <laughs> so let me make sure this email didn't go to Never Never Land. Uh, so I called the number that was on it. Sure enough, he answered the phone, and then that got us talking, and then he wanted to do this and this and this, and it's a, it, that's part of the thing that got the Vortex going. There were other things, too, but that was part of it. So anyway, that code hopefully will be here. He said he thought he could get me most of the codes today. Uh, and if he does get it to me today, the trouble is I have a, after this I have 30 minutes, and since I didn't get to eat, start my lunch in the previous 30 minutes because I went right through the time while I was stuck in the vortex and uh, lost track of time completely. So I'll probably be eating lunch and probably won't check then. Then I'm in class from 1.15 to 5.45, and then I'm off to home. So uh, maybe tomorrow morning I may, if he has responded by then, I'll try to sit, send something out on Blackboard. Okay. Uh, you know, I'll put an announcement in Blackboard and also send an email yes, through sir. Blackboard. Yes, uh, if he gets back to me and I see it by tomorrow morning. Probably not tonight. Could happen tonight, but not likely. Well, it possible. All right, so here's your original matrix. Uh, then minus 1, 2, 0, 3, and 2, negative 3, 4, 1. Okay. Now, if that were your original matrix and you wanted to start operating on this with your elementary mode operations, What's the first thing you want to be true about that matrix? What do you want that to be? A 1. And it's kind of hard to make a 0 into a 1. Okay? You can't do it. None of your operations will do that for you. You can't multiply 0 by anything and make it a 1. Okay? So, but what you can do... The closest thing you've got to a 1 here is a minus 1, right? So we could exchange these two rows. And that's a legal elementary row operation. And it produces an equivalent matrix. Okay? So what we're going to do is row... Uh, now they're rows, not equation. Row 1 exchanges with row 2. Okay? So that produces... row Your new row 1 is minus 1... 2, 0, 3. Your new row 2 is 0, 1, 3, 4. And row 3 didn't change at all. 2, negative 3, 4, 1. Okay. Now, notice the advantage of doing this to an equation. You don't have to write down all those variables. They never change, but you, have to, you don't have to write them down. And then 2, in my mind, it's easier to see that you don't make any errors because with all those subscripts in there and stuff like that all that gets messy you know when you use x1 x of one x of two x of three x, now you got just extra numbers in there that are easy to get confused so there we've done the first row the first operation okay now if i were continuing the book doesn't but if I were continuing, I would say, but wait a minute, I wanted that to be a plus one, didn't I? So what can we do to this row? You can multiply by a negative one. You can either multiply or divide by a negative one. So that would make this one minus two, zero to the minus three. There's your second operation. Multiply uh, the entire row by a non-zero number. 
or divide the entire row by a non-zero Okay? And then once you got that done, and that became a 1, negative 2, 0, negative 3, then I could multiply that row by minus 2, add it to this row, you, you eliminate the 2 down here. So you see, you can do all your different operations, and you would. They just did one operation with this one. Then they go to an entirely new matrix, which is this one. Has nothing to do with the first one. Uh, 2, negative 4, 6, and negative 2. Second row, 1, 3, negative 3, 0. Third row, 5, negative 2, 1, 2. Okay. Now, how do you usually want to start your row reduction? What do you want to be true? What you always want to start with. A 1 in the upper left. Now, in this one, you could exchange two rows, and then you get one in the upper left. But there is another way to go on this one, and what might that be? Yes, multiply one half by everything in the first row. So we'll do, I like to write it this way, row one over two is the new row one. I like dividing by two rather than multiplying by one half, but it doesn't matter. Either way you want to do it. Those mean the same thing. So what would be your new row one? Right? Negative 1. And then you could write down your second row, 1, 3, minus 3, 0. And your third row, 5, minus 2, 1, 2. I hope that's a 2 and not a Z. Okay. Yeah. You've done it. Now, they're not carrying this any further, I don't think. Right? So, but if I were... The next thing I want is that to become a zero. So what I would do is multiply this one by minus one, add to that. So you do it the entire row. And see what happens there. They're only doing one step at a time. That this isn't necessary necessarily equations you're trying to solve, but that would be my next step if it were. Alright. Now let's go to this one. A completely new matrix. Looks similar to some of the others, but not quite the same. 1, 2, minus 4, 3. 0, 3, negative 2, negative 1. 2, 1, 5, negative 2. Okay. What's usually the first thing you want to happen with a matrix? One in the upper left. Hey, we got it. We don't have to do a thing to get it. It's there. Then we usually want the next thing we want to happen. A zero below it. We got it. We don't have to do a single thing to get it. And then what we want to happen? A zero below that as well. Okay? Here we're going to have to do something. How can you make that two into a zero? Now, hint. Always use the leading one. Okay, there's your leading one. How do you use that to make that become a zero? Negative two times row one added to row three becomes a new row three. Okay? So in other words, if you've got a 1 here, that leading 1, that's why we always use them, then whatever this number is, negate it, multiply by that, add it to that. Works every time. This is adding a multiple of one row to another row. That's the third elementary row operation. To give you an equivalent matrix. Row equivalent matrix. Alright, so let's do it. We're using the first row. Don't mess with it. 1, 2, minus 4, 3. 
the zero was there right where we want it in the second one, so don't mess with that one either. Zero, three, negative two, negative one. The third row, we're doing this operation to. Multiplying negative two times the top, adding to the third. So what does that give us? Negative two times one is plus two is Eh? Eh? Negative 2 plus 2. Oh, Negative 2 plus 2. It's negative. Second? Zero. If I had lost two, yeah, yeah, if I had lost two baseballs and then went and found two baseballs, <laughs> uh, borrowed two baseballs to replace the ones I lost, I'm still at zero baseball, right? Or something like that. All right, let's continue. You do it through the whole row. Minus 2 times 2. Minus 4 plus 1 is negative 3. Minus 2 times minus 4 is positive 8. Plus 5 is 13. And minus 2 times 3 is negative 6. Minus 2 is negative 8. Perfect. So 0, negative 3, 13, negative 8. That's your new third row. All right. Let's move on to example 7. We're going to put this to the test now and do what we need to do to solve a linear system, but this time using an associated augmented matrix. Okay, here's your system of equations. x minus 2y plus 3z, I can't write very well, is equal to 9. I think we've seen this one before. Minus x plus 3y is equal to minus 4. 2x minus 5y plus 5z is equal to 17. All right. First thing we do is write this as an augmented matrix. So you tell me what it's going to look like. 1, negative 2, 3, 9. Perfect. Okay, second row. Negative 1, 3, 0, negative 4. Perfect. Third row. 2, negative 5, 5, 17. All right. Now, sorry, I've got the, I know what it is. I've got the hunger, okay? I didn't get to eat start my lunch, so I am starving. My stomach's been up there growling. Hopefully you haven't heard or it hasn't been picked up by the computer. Uh, so let's go from here. Uh-oh. When I move my screen, which falls back, it sometimes blinks out, but it's gone. Blink back on. What's the first thing you want to have in your matrix? A uh, leading one in the first upper left corner. We got it. We don't have to do a single thing. What do we want to happen next? Zero below it, okay? That's going to be pretty easy to do. How will we do that? Add row one to row two. So row one plus row two becomes a new row two. Okay, let's do that. I like to handle just one row at a time because it keeps me from getting confused. We're using row one. That's the one with the leading one. So we just write it down. One minus two, three, nine. Okay, now remember, what do these columns stand for? The first column are the coefficients of your x, the second column is the coefficient of the y, third column coefficients of z, and the fourth column is your constant. Okay, just keep that in mind. All right, so we're going to add those two rows together. What does your first term become? Zero. Minus one, or one minus one is zero. Second row, one. Negative two plus three is one. Third row, 
3 because 3 plus 0 is 3. Fourth row, 5 because 9 minus 4 is 5. All right, now rather than writing everything down again, let's go on and deal with row 3. Using your leading coefficient of 1 in row 1, how do we, what do we want row 3 to be? What's, what do we want the feature to be? Yes, so that 2 to become a 0, how do we make that happen? Negative 2 times row 1 plus row 3 becomes the new row 3. So let's do it. Negative 2 times 1 is, okay, adds a 0. Negative 2 plus 2 is 0. Okay, the next one, negative 2 times negative four, 2 is positive 4 minus 5 is minus 1. Okay, negative 2 times 3 is negative 6 plus 5 is negative 1. And negative 2 times 9 is negative 18 plus 17 is negative 1. Hey, there weren't those big numbers. They disappeared on us, didn't they? Pretty much. All right. Now, what's the next thing we want to happen? You've got the first leading one with zeros below it. So go to the second row. And you want the first non-zero entry to be a 1. Hey, we got it already, so we don't have to do a thing. What do we want to happen next, sir? The zero below it, so you want that negative 1 to become a 0. And how do you make that happen? Row 2 plus row 3 becomes a new row 3. You add a multiple of 1 of row 2, which is 1 times row 2, to row 3. That's your new row 3. So let's do it. Row 1, we're not messing with. That has that leading 1. We don't want to change it. So 1, negative 2, 3, and 9. That doesn't change. Row 2, we're using that negative 1, so leave that alone. 0, 1. Uh, it's that leading 1, not negative 1. 3, 5. And now the last row, that's the one we're changing. It's row 2 plus row 3. So 0 plus 0 is... 0, 1 minus 1 is 0, 3 minus 1 is 2, and 5 minus 1 is 4. Okay, I'm sorry, my hearing's bad. All right, so let's review. We wanted to start with a leading 1, zero is below it. Got it. Go to the second row, first on zero entry, we want to be a 1. Got it. Zero is below. Got it. What do we want to happen next? Third row. The first non-zero entry we want to be a one. And how do we get that to happen? Divide by two. So row three divided by two is the new row three. Okay? So... This becomes, these are all equivalent matrices. 1 minus 2, 3, 9, 0, 1, 3, 5, and 0, 0, 5, the bottom row by 2. 1, 2. Hopefully this is looking familiar. Okay, time out. Remember what this stands for? The first column of the coefficients of x, second column coefficient of y, third column coefficient of z, fourth column your constant. So what do we have here? z equals 2. Done. We've got z equal 2 right there. So we know z is equal to 2. Now we use that to do the same thing for this one. This is coefficient of the y, so that would be y plus 3 times 2 is 6 is equal to 5. So what would that produce y to be equal to? Negative 1. And then up here we plug in y is negative 1 and z is equal to 2. So you have 1 is the coefficient of x, so it would be x minus 
2 times y, but y is a minus 1. So minus 2 minus 1. I'm sorry. <clears throat> I'm sorry, my throat just gets clogged up. Okay, let's try that again. 1, that's, I mean, that 1x, so that's x minus 2 times minus 1 is plus 1. Not plus 2, sorry. Plus 2, so 1, I mean, x plus 2, let me write them down, uh, plus 3 times 2, that would be plus 6, is equal to 9. So guess what x is? 1. And here we have our triplet, ordered triplet, 1 minus 1, 2. That is the one and only solution for this system of equations. Now, I think we've checked this before because we've done it before, but let's just do it again quickly. When you put a one in here, you get one plus two, that would be three, plus six would be nine. Yep, we got that one. We got a minus one, minus three, that would be minus four. You got a minus four, okay? And you got a 2 times 1 is 2, plus 5, <clears throat> here it goes again, 2 plus 5, plus 10, 2 plus 5 is 7, plus 10 is 7. So <coughs> that solves the equation, and that's the only set of order triplet that will solve the equation. Now, this matrix we got here is row equivalent to every other matrix we had because we were doing our elementary row operations. But this one we say is in row echelon form. Remember what that stood for? Two features of row echelon form. The leading non-zero entry in each row is a 1. And those non-zero entries, those leading ones, step to the right as you go down. They could step twice to the right or three times to the right, but they always are moving to the right. Okay? And sure enough, that's in row echelon form. Later we'll give a different name for this, but for now, that's what we're calling it, row echelon form. Now, do we have time for the blocks at the bottom of the page? Got what, three or four minutes? Five minutes. Let's try it. Okay, I think I'll go to a clean page if that's okay. Okay, and let's do this box at the bottom of page 15. A matrix is in, in row echelon form has the final, I've just said it. Do I need to do it again? Okay. Any rows consist, let me write it down just in case somebody else doesn't have a book. Okay, a matrix in row echelon form I've never used the term echelon except in this course, okay? Row echelon form I don't think I've ever used it anywhere has the following properties. One. This is one I didn't mention I should have. Any rows consisting entirely of zero entirely of zeros occur at the bottom of the matrix. Some reason my pen's not right. Okay, that's the one I didn't mention before. Any rows consisting entirely of zeros, put them at the bottom. <clears throat> if you have more than one, just stack them at the bottom. Number two, each row that does not consist entirely of zeros. Okay, the first non-entry
must be that leading one. I'm going to go and write it leading one. That's what we call it, but they don't call it yet. But that's what we call it, a leading one. A, oh, they do say, called the leading one. Okay, number three. Okay, two successive non-zero rows Okay, for two successive non-zero rows, the leading one in the upper row is further to the left than the leading one in the lower row. Okay, those are your three uh, features of row echelon form. Okay, now there's one other definition also included in this box. A matrix in row echelon uh, a matrix in row echelon form is also called. Okay, they phrase this poorly. The definition for a reduced row echelon form. After a while, I'm going to call it REF, row echelon form, so I don't have to write that anymore. Row echelon form, okay, is when every column okay, that's an end there, ha that has a leading one has zeros in every position above and below the leading one. Okay. You've already said it before, and just to re-emphasize it. To be in row echelon form, that's the top, row echelon form, every leading one has zeros below it. To be in reduced row echelon form, every leading one has zeros below and above it. Okay? And that will lead to reduced row echelon form. That leads to the second thing we do here. The first, when we got it in row echelon form, we use Gaussian elimination and back substitution. When we get in row echelon, reduced row echelon form, that's when we do Gauss-Jordan elimination. And we'll get to that next. So example four is a piece of cake. It's just identifying row echelon form, but I think we're out of time for cake. So we're going to have to eat our cake next week. Okay. And you aren't here to hear the good news, bad news situation, were you? Okay. The bad news is... Next week, Monday is Labor Day, school is closed, no, ca no ca classes at all. The good news is it doesn't affect us any because we meet on Tuesday and Thursday. So we don't lose a day. All right, I knew that would make you happy. All right, good deal. Have a good weekend. A good long Fourth of I mean Labor Day weekend. Thank you.